questions, write them down, and uh, as things come to mind, use that. And um, we're just going to turn the whole evening over to Dr. Hayden, and I really appreciate you coming. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you all for coming out. I'm Chase. Last name is Hayden. That's why she said Dr. Hayden, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, it's good to see a lot of familiar faces. I recognize a lot of people here. And then I see some other people that I don't recognize. So, welcome aboard. Hopefully, tonight is a benefit to you all and that we have a chance to all learn something together, whether it's catching dry, uh, these things <laughs> or something about health. <laughs> all right, cool. Um, so, to begin with, the thing I don't want to do is just bore you to death. I want you to be able to come for a purpose, right? So, so hopefully you guys have thoughts or questions that you want to ask me, and then we will try and answer them today in front of everybody on the whiteboard. Um, when it comes to the basic premise in which I take to health, I'm a chiropractor by profession. I do something called functional medicine, which means I look at the body from a functional standpoint, that includes structural, neurological, and nutritional approaches. So even though someone may come to see me because they have shoulder pain, for example, that shoulder pain may be because they have a bone out of place that I need to crack in place, because that's what chiropractors do, right? They manipulate joints and mess with muscles. But it could be that their shoulder pain is referred pain from like a liver or gallbladder issue. And so then I would address that nutritionally instead of just structurally. That happened earlier this week, for example, someone came in uh, from Sugarland that had excruciating shoulder, neck, and nauseous pain. And we went through and did our exam, and basically nothing showed up from the structural side of things. But when I jabbed under her ribs and did something called a Murphy's test, which is for gallbladder issues, it jumped, she jumped off the table and was lit up from that. She said, okay, maybe we've got a gallbladder issue more than we have a shoulder issue. And if I sat there and just did all my chiropractic stuff to you, it may be less efficient than what it could be. So we tried doing some things, and since last week. Yesterday she called, she, just, she said she's doing better. Not perfect yet, but we're trying to do stuff to help support her nutritional system so that pain goes down, function returns. Um, and that's pretty much the premise I take with all of our patients. And so when I use complementary and alternative medicine, I complement traditional medicine in some situations, and then we do alternative things in others, depending on what's going on. All within a structural, nutritional, or neurologic standpoint. Well, with that being said, we're going to talk about some basic overreaching premises that we can address starting today to try and become a healthier individual. And I'll talk about the two biggest things that we can change starting tomorrow to do that, independent of any doctor you ever talk to or any particular symptom you may have, because these two things address a lot of underlying inflammatory pathways in the body. And these two things both revolve around what you eat. No, no, no one was really nervous about that, right? Y'all knew you were coming in early. You're going to be told that something we eat probably makes us sick, right? Your friends warned you. Uh, so the foods we eat, right, create the inflammation that we have. Even if we have a genetic thing, or an autoimmune thing, or a car wreck thing, or whatever it might be. Because if we eat something and it creates inflammation in our body, then we're slowing down the healing or the recuperative process that the body's trying to go through due to that inflammation. It's a simple premise, but there's a lot of research that indicates that things we put into our body create inflammatory reactions. Now, does that mean that these foods we eat on day one when we're born automatically start killing us? And the answer is no. Think of it, and I use this example a lot in the office, if you broke your leg, you're probably not gonna go jogging on it that night, right? So therefore, jogging is not inherently bad, but jogging on a broken leg jacks you up, right? So certain things we eat may be perfectly fine when our inflammation is under control. Whereas once the inflammation sets in, those certain things may make it worse for us. Okay? I'm on a trip on this. So we'll move it out of the way. So how do we decide which foods are good foods and which foods are bad foods? I guarantee you, if you ask anyone in the room, they're going to give you a different opinion than what the person next to them make it. Unless you're a patient in my office, then you already know the answers. Um, so, me as a clinical nutritionist, I have opinions on what I think is good food versus bad food. Dietitians have certain ideas on what they think are good foods or bad foods. 
Vegetarians think they know what good food is, bad food is. Paleo people think they know what good food and bad food is. And so the list goes on and we're all running around scratching our heads wondering what to eat. As long as it doesn't taste good, it's probably good for you, right? <laughs> <laughs> so generally, generally it's that right? No matter who you talk to, if it tastes like cardboard, it's probably what the issue is. Um, so generally speaking, though, if we think about what we're eating and then what potentially creates inflammation, our goal would be to try and diminish that. There are a couple of schools of thought as to how to do this, and there are some very simple guidelines which you can take with you. First and foremost, the more processed it is, the more likely it is that it creates inflammation. Does that mean that all processed food is bad? Not necessarily, because we don't want to talk in gross generalities where everything is bad and everything that's not that is good, but, but there's general premises in which if it's processed, it probably has a longer shelf life, which means it had to be refined in some way, shape, or form which means whatever it naturally grew with probably was removed. And if it was removed, it's more likely that they had to put other stuff inside of it to let it last longer. Things like sugars or MSG or translutaminases for meats or just random things that they stick inside food to let it sit on the grocery store shelf longer so that by the time you get it, it can sit in your closet or ca cabinet or pantry, there you go, um, long enough so that eventually you eat it and it's fine. That's why a box of Cheerios has an expiration date for like two years from now. Okay? If we plucked weed up off the ground and let it sit there in the barn, it would go bad faster than that once it cracks. Right? So if we try and just diminish inflammation and we start by just reducing packaged things, things get better. But we can be more specific than that. In clinical settings, I typically look at people's blood type in order to shortcut the process in order to figure out which foods are more likely inflammatory them, for them or not. So there are four blood types, A, A, B, B, and O. There are books dedicated to this concept, which I think at least helps about 80% of the time. There are obviously outliers to all of this, and this is not one size fits all. Moses didn't bring this diet down off the mountain with the stone tablets or anything. It's just a concept that tends to help people. Wherein, if you eat according to your blood type, you tend to get lower inflammation, and then you start to see what happens. Once again, if we think back to that concept of a broken leg, this doesn't mean you have to do this indefinitely, but if you have inflammation, and you stop jogging on it because you have a cast on your leg, your leg will get better faster. If you have inflammation that's affecting your joints, your sleep, your sex drive, your whatever, and you eat accordingly, as if you had a cast on that leg, and then your body gets better, you can then slowly reintroduce these foods again that we removed to see if they create a problem or not. That's the basic underlying premise. It's called an elimination diet, and it's the gold standard in medicine to figure out which foods mess you up. For example, gold standard means it's the only way that peer-reviewed medical research is gonna work. You can do blood tests, but those may not give you reproducible results all the time. So this is why I use this in my office rather than a blood test immediately. Though sometimes we try doing blood tests if this isn't working. But if we look at the top four foods in all blood types, it's gonna be very simple. That's why if you know someone in my office, they already know the answers to this. Gluten, casein, corn, and soy are the top four foods for all blood types that tend to be problematic. Now, does that mean that God put cows on the earth to kill us? Not necessarily. <laughs> but if you have a broken leg and you go jogging, that messes up your broken leg. So sometimes, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you all what casein means. Casein means cow's milk. Um, so it's a protein from cow's milk. So sometimes that's enough of an inflammatory trigger to slow down the process of healing and recovery. Sometimes it's not. I have some people that I tell they should eat dairy because of how their body works which may sound like blasphemy to some of us in the room, right? Because I tell you, get off of dairy so much. But in some situations, it's no big deal. So if we're looking at gluten, which is another word for a protein found in wheat, barley, and rye, and casein, which is a milk protein, the other one is whey, if you were wondering, corn and soy, we see a list of foods that tend to be inflammatory when someone has inflammatory conditions. Obviously there are certain conditions that associate with each one of these. Like you could be lactose intolerant and have a milk problem, but technically that's not a casein issue. 
that's a milk sugar issue. Or you can have celiac disease and have a gluten problem that's an autoimmune condition, but yet you could also just have a hard time getting pregnant and you get off of these foods and the research shows that if you get off of gluten and dairy while you're trying to get pregnant, your odds go up. Because it helps change the inflammatory state throughout your body and now your hormonal system works better from it. Does that mean every person who can't get pregnant is eat off gluten and dairy? Not necessarily. But if you walk in my office and you're saying, hey, I want to try and get pregnant, I'm going to start with some basic premises that say let's lower inflammation and let your body start trying to heal and recover itself. Sometimes it works really well. Birth control to eat. Sometimes it works less well. Um, that's not to say those of you who are gluten and dairy free in the office right now are going to get pregnant, so don't be concerned. <laughs> don't go have a discussion with your spouse. Um, if we're looking at other foods that tend to be inflammatory based off of blood type, for an A blood type, a category shows up called nightshades and beef. This is where cows are trying to kill you. For AB blood types, it becomes nightshades and beef and occasionally even chicken. I know, these people tend to do really, really, really well on a vegetarian vegan diet if you're an AB blood type. That does not mean that all AB blood types do this, but a lot of times people come to the office and they're like, yeah, I don't even eat meat because I feel like <coughs> when I do it, and that's what they're telling me before they even start the process I'm telling them. Um, B blood types also tend to not do well with nightshades, but chicken seems to irritate them as well. And O blood types are the people with the iron stomachs, and they tend to just do fine if you get them off of dairy. That's like their biggest kryptonite is dairy, it seems to be for O blood types. It's not everybody, because technically these four irritate across the boards, but if we're looking at pure statistics and laboratory results, those would be the top six or seven foods for each blood type. And statistically speaking, people's inflammatory status will dramatically improve by avoiding them. So what's the process? Today, you hear all this information. Tomorrow you decide with your significant other that you're gonna stop eating everything that tastes good and you're gonna do what we've said to do in the office, or today right now, right? So you go home and you come out with this idea that you're gonna go gluten, dairy, corn, soy, nightshade, and beef free because you're an A blood type. And you think, what am I going to possibly eat? This is everything that I eat on a daily basis, right? Which is fine, because that's why we have a bunch of inflammation and we may not be getting the results health-wise we're looking for, is because we keep jogging on this broken leg, right? So we take this out of our diet, we do it for 30 days. So day one we start, 30 days from now, we put one of the foods back in, because it's an elimination diet, we slowly add back in and we see what happens. So if we take it out for 30 days and then we add beef, and our weight goes up and our digestion goes crazy and we can't see straight when we're driving to work the next day, maybe beef is a problem. So we take it back out of our life, we get to feel it normal again, we put beef back into our diet and see what happens. If all those same symptoms flare up, congratulations, beef might be an issue for you. Simple, right? Because it's an elimination diet. We take it out, we eliminate it, we put it back in and we see if things change after a period of time. The closest analogy that I've ever found about this comes to smoking. I don't know how many of you have ever tried smoking before in your life, but the very first time someone ever tries smoking, their body has a significant reaction from it. They get headaches, they choke, they throw up, they do whatever, because their body said, hey dude, this creates inflammation and I don't like it. But whether due to peer pressure or social stress or whatever, they continue smoking, and after six months, they no longer have those reactions. They can go 30 years and never choke, cough, gag, or throw up from smoking anymore. But if they take it out of their life for a period, two months, three months, and they put it back in, they will have a similar reaction to the first time. Because their body said, whatever you're doing to me right now is killing me, please stop. So they choke and gag and throw up. But then when they continue reintroducing that stressor to them, their body adapts, and later they develop cancer from it, but yet it adapts in that moment to try and protect the immediate inflammatory response. All of us were given gluten, dairy, corn, soy, nightshades, or beef at some point in our life prior to today. A lot of us as kids, you know, sit in church, they give you Cheerios or goldfish so you'll be quiet, you know, whatever it might be. And now all of a sudden, you're getting stomach problems, you're colicky, you're, you know, getting fevers from when you're teething and having reactions, and all these things are happening, and then your body stops the reactions, and now you show up in my office at 34, 35 years old, you can't lose weight, your energy's down, your sex drive is terrible, your hair's falling out, and you're like, what's going on with me? And I say, get off of gluten, and you say, but I've been eating gluten my whole life. Well, 
if you've been smoking a cigarette for 30 years, you don't notice that the cigarette's a problem anymore. So we get off of gluten for a period. We feel better most of the time. We put gluten back into our life. If we feel fine still, then great. It wasn't gluten, it was one of the other ones. But if we put gluten back into our life and our weight goes back up and our energy goes back down and our sleep gets messed up, then maybe gluten was the problem all along and we were masking it with Advil or Tylenol or Motrin or whatever people use to try and suppress symptoms. That's not to say that those medications don't have a place, but if we're sitting over here painting over rust all day because we have a gluten reaction that creates inflammation, we're not getting healthier, we're covering up the symptoms. So, from an elimination standpoint, if we pick the foods that we're most likely reactive to and take them out for a long enough period in which our body has a chance to make a change and then put them back in, we will see a potential inflammatory reaction if that food truly is a problem. How long does that take? Usually 30 days is my starting point. That doesn't mean everybody's perfect within 30 days, but usually you can see enough of a change, whether it's weight loss or energy improving or whatever, to see that it's different. But that's dependent upon the symptom. Like if someone has weird PMS, mood swings and stuff, they're only having a cycle every 28-ish days. So we may have to go six months like that. So they have six different opportunities to see if it's really getting better or not. Mm -hmm. The same thing would be if trying to get pregnant. If someone walks in and says, I want to get pregnant, I'd say, okay, it's a six to nine month process because we have to see. But if someone's having an upset stomach or diarrhea or just tired, they should see it within the first couple of weeks usually. If they start feeling better. Yes, y'all can ask questions. Don't, don't hesitate. Don't to shy. Yes, ma'am. We don't know what nightshades are. That's a great question. Tomatoes. What are nightshades? Um, nightshades include tomatoes, eggplants, potatoes, white potatoes, goji berries, tobacco. Your peppers, green peppers. Peppers, green peppers, and paprika, stuff like that. It's a certain classification of food that's called nightshade something in Latin. Um, what these tend to have is something called sololines, and those are neurotransmitter disruptors that tend to be more inflammatory. So potato skins are poisonous if you get sololine toxicity, and a lot of A and AB and B blood types don't clear the sololines quick enough through their liver, and that's why it seems to create more inflammatory stuff. So from a pure blood type standpoint, you could start here. Conditionally, con that doesn't, that's not a real word, let me rephrase that. From a condition-specific standpoint, you can pick foods that are more likely to be applicable to you. Okay? So if you have an autoimmune condition, like rheumatoid arthritis, you've got small joint pain, hurts when you wake up, everything's sore, nightshades quickly go to the top of the list. Yes, ma'am? Why? Why? Clinical research indicates that's what happens. So if someone walks into my office and they say, hey, I've got rheumatoid arthritis, we have an immediate discussion on why we get to avoid nightshades for at least 30, day, 30 days. That doesn't mean every person with an autoimmune condition like rheumatoid arthritis gets better, but most of them have a significant change. How about MS? Uh, MS, I'd probably go more with corn, but gluten has strong correlations with MS as well. So anything neurologically related, MS, Parkinson's, seizures, whatever, gluten and corn tend to be on the higher end of the spectrum. Dairy can still do it, but gluten and corn are the higher ones. When it's mucus-related stuff, so you get eye goobers in the morning, or you're always having to blow your nose, or you're always sniffly, or your ear wax is like crazy, or you're a breastfeeding mom that has like lactation problems, like not producing enough, or the clogged ducts are always happening, that's like almost always a dairy issue. A lot of digestive-related things tend to be indicate being more gluten-related things, as skin is more gluten and corn, and if you're a female in your reproductive years, like between the ages of like 13 and 40, and I don't know, it's a big group, it's a big group, y'all get hormonally messed up sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but when y'all have these hormonal issues, you have breast tenderness and bloating and weird cycles and whatever, a lot of that is gluten, dairy, and soy. Soy tends to act like an estrogen mimicker in the body. So when you, women are having hormonal issues, their estrogen is high and their progesterone is low, and you want it to be in the good range. Well, if you're eating soy, you're making estrogen artificially higher in your body due to its estrogenic effects. So by removing it, it at least gives that a chance to come down to a better range to get back to the closer ratio. Um, but I mean, that's how we can almost use food as a way of reducing inflammation, but 
doing it from a condition specific way based off of our symptoms because it's not that everyone always has breast tenderness and weird periods because they're female. It's that people are having hormonal imbalances and their body's inflammatory threshold is at the limit and whatever we're doing on a daily basis is keeping it there and not allowing it to come back to being normal. Mm -hmm. Same thing with headaches or digestion problems or whatever it might be. Yes, ma'am. O's will not have nightshade beef chicken problems or they can, but not generally. Generally speaking, they do not. But Anybody can technically react to anything. Right. Like bananas could be on this list right now for you, whereas it's not for everyone else. So that's why we start with the statistically high ones. But technically, if you Google, the, the book is called Eat Right for Your Type. And there's a lot of discrepancy as to if this really works or not. But clinically, I find it to be significantly huge from getting people's inflammation down and feeling better. So I start with the top five to seven foods. He's, the guy that wrote the book has lists and pages and pages of what to eat and what not to eat based off of blood type and rationale for why, et cetera. And I just don't find that bananas for an A blood type make that as big of a deal, even though it's technically on the list. Um, most people who are A blood types tend to do okay, even if they're eating bananas. Once they get the top four to seven out, five, six, whatever that is. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Don't be shy. Oh, I just want to say something. Yes, ma'am. About that 30-day thing. Yes. For anybody that wonders about that, 20 years ago or so, I went off dairy for 30 days, and it didn't make an impact. But after a while, if you're on inhalers and prescription medicines, and you don't want to have to do that for your whole life, you say, hey, I wonder if doctors like Dr. Hayden you know, are make sense when they say try it for four months or six months. Maybe your body needs that amount of time. So about 15 years ago, I did that for an extended period of time. And after six months, I was off all prescription medicines, and I've never had to go back on them. Right. So it may sound scary, but try it one step at a time, and it's right. such a huge life difference. And, and the little secret of my office, which some of you have noticed, is I may say start for 30 days, but that doesn't mean at the end of 30 days you just go back to eating whatever you want. Like, <laughs> like, like we've obviously oh, seen that that doesn't really happen, right? Hard. We do this as an initial experiment <laughs> for two reasons. One, I want to know if it's starting to work, and two, so that people rationally can see there might be an end to this. And if it's not you walking in on day one and me saying never eat anything that tastes good in your life again, right? Because <laughs> then people walk out and they're like, I cannot get help from anybody anymore. And that's not the purpose. So we started up in, conceptual boundaries and say, you know what, for 30 days, let me try this. And if after 30 days it didn't work, what did I lose? You know, a month of my life, maybe, and I didn't have a Pop-Tart. But if it 30 days later you're feeling a whole lot better, then, oh cool, maybe that Pop-Tart's not that big of a deal anymore because I feel so much different. Oh, yes ma'am. Uh, you mentioned, you know, about the smoking and everything and like being, you know, that this shows up like in your 30s. What about children that are like two? Would they have issues or show issues like this? Some of them, yes. And that's because we're also genetic people that come with, <laughs> for lack of a better word, sense from our parents. So that's not really what it is. Does that make sense? Dirty like, genes. yeah, dirty genes <laughs> get passed down and they create dirty kids. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, so, yes, for example, if you have a dairy problem, and we have this inflammatory response that's going and going and growing and whatever, and then you have offspring with an inflammatory dairy sensitive situation, that can be transmitted down and have them express it a whole lot earlier than you might. We all know that guy who drinks, drinks and smokes till he's 106 and never has an issue, right? That's good genetics. We also know those people that smoke once and die of cancer within six months because they just have that issue too. So we do have a genetic background that we have to deal with. Um, but we're looking for functional manifestation of change by changing the inflammatory states that we have. Yes, ma'am. I was, I had five children when I was having dairy and they all projectile vomited for months. I mean, that's, it's not just spitting up, it's a huge issue. Mm -hmm. And the sixth child, I had been dairy free for over a year and no projectile vomiting or anything. So I know that it made a difference. I concur. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have two daughters that cannot stand pork. Right. Hot dogs, you cannot even cook them in my house. <laughs> Just the smell. Just the smell will drive my two daughters crazy. Could that be part of this? Um, because Possibly. yeah, Pork's like a dirty animal, though. I mean, like, oh, yeah. some people can tolerate it really good, really well. Some people can't tolerate it at all. 
I don't eat hot dogs either. You don't like the good hippie ones from like Sprouts or whatever. Well, <laughs> and, and, and the, only pork, the only pork they'll eat is if I do it in a roast. Oh yeah. No pork in the house at all because they will start saying the stomach hurts. No more. Get it out of the house. Interesting. It, it could be. I don't know. It's not statistically a high one per se, mm -hmm. but religiously speaking, some people don't do pork, <coughs> and there might be something to that that's been passed down that we've lost in Americanizing everything. Um, but it may not have anything to do with that either, and it may just be your daughters getting that card in their lot in life. Cool. Any questions with this before I erase it? One more yes, ma'am. Um, the chicken, does that include turkey? It doesn't. For some reason, it doesn't include eggs either. Whatever the chickens do between <laughs> hatching <laughs> and being plucked up by Tyson makes them get jacked up. So. It's what they eat. It's, it's probably what they eat. It's a lot, the chickens are fed on corn and soil. Yeah. Uh, that's all they are fed. Um, <coughs> yes, sir. The one, the one question that I have that, um, just to make sure I understand what you're saying here, okay, so you're saying that certain blood types have a tendency to be, you know, more sensitive or whatever to these other foods, but what you're, and when you were talking about, if you have such and such a condition that, it's, that it, there's a statistical likelihood that it's, you know, right. whatever, but you're not saying that the two, like, it's a type A with this condition, it's that. It's no. anybody with that condition, anyway, no matter what so, the type is. So okay. if someone walks in there's like, Chase, I'm tired, I have high blood pressure and want to lose weight, I will lean more to blood type removal at the beginning. Mm -hmm. If a woman walks in and says, I want to get pregnant and I have crazy PMS and my boobs hurt all the time and I just can't think straight and want to strangle my husband, <laughs> I warn the husband. <laughs> then, <laughs> then I get them off of gluten, dairy, corn, and soy, definitely. But that's the same for all blood types. So that's a bad example, I guess, symptom-wise. But I'd be more a little bit more specific when it comes to that. So it might be an O blood type with rheumatoid that I also get off nightshades, even though that's not statistically high from that standpoint. Yes, ma'am. What about like brain fog and, and we're difficulty we work finding and, and difficulty with memory? Right. Is that just all the same thing? I think that's a perfect segue into the next step of what we're working towards. So I appreciate that question. What about, um, old the, what about old injuries? Old injuries? Yes and no. Um, so let me answer both of those questions as we talk about why in the next slide, because it makes sense. Um, I forgot to ask. Everybody's good with this, right? Okay. What was the question? The questions are, what, how do old injuries play a role into this? And what about something like brain fog or poor ro word recall? or something like that, do inflammatory foods play a role? The answer is yes, but what else might go along with it? So if we're looking at just things you could do tomorrow, there's two of them that are tremendously important. Number one is get off inflammatory foods for your blood type, and that's a good starting point. Do it for at least 30 days, and then slowly reintroduce one food at a time over the course of three to four days, and just see what happens to you. If your brain fog gets better, or your old football knee injury gets better, and then all of a sudden you eat a piece of pizza and your knee hurts again, or you can't find your car keys in the morning, maybe there's a correlation. So you have to look for causation, not just association. Because maybe you just had a bad day that day too. So we have to look to see if it, is it reproducible or not. So number one, we remove inflammatory foods. Which you now know what they are. You don't even have to come see me ever again. You don't know the answer. Number two, when it comes to balancing out the inflammatory status in someone's life, is that a good is to get a good handle on blood sugar. Now, just because we wrote blood sugar up here does not mean you have to be a diabetic to have a problem with blood sugar issues. Blood sugar is your body's ability to maintain itself at a good level dependent upon what you're eating. So if we have four pieces of pizza, some regular Coke, and some ice cream, and we check our blood sugar, it's going to be very different than if we had a steak and asparagus, right? Yeah. Now, does that mean those other things don't taste delicious? Because they do, we all know it, we've been there. But those are gonna start creating inflammation from the proteins inside of those foods because statistically speaking, if we have symptoms already, that's gonna make it worse. But it's also gonna start this pattern of blood sugar mismanagement where your blood sugar is gonna go up and down in a very crazy way. We've all seen it before. You wake up in the morning, you have some pancakes, you have a cup of orange juice, and you eat two pieces of toast because that's what they show you on TV for breakfast, right? And then by 10 o'clock, you can't see straight because you're falling asleep and you need a pick-me-up. So you have a Coke, or you have a Snickers bar, or you have an apple, or you, just eat, you have to eat something by 10 because you're crashing. 
and then it picks back up and then around lunchtime it starts falling again so you go out and get a sandwich or some pasta or something and it goes up and then at three o'clock it crashes again and it goes over and over in that process that mechanism of blood sugar mismanagement by doing this stimulates a process that creates a cytokine reaction a cytokine is fancy doctor word for inflammatory hormone so you have this inflammatory hormone that comes out in addition to another hormone called cortisol that creates inflammation and stress response in the body so your body basically has the chemical reaction of being chased by a bear and not knowing what to do about it <laughs> chemically that's what happens when your blood sugar does weird stuff now if it does it long enough your cells get inflamed you start you stop absorbing the sugars and you get told you're diabetic but even if you do it on a daily basis and you're not diagnosed as diabetic, that reaction starts. Is that like the fight or flight, the stress, fight or flight? Um, the reaction this creates would be similar to a fight or flight response, yes. This doesn't necessarily mean you're having a fight or flight but reaction, your but your body thinks, thinks you, are. you are. Correct. So cortisol goes up and cytokines go up. And there are a bunch of different types of cytokines, but they're inflammatory hormones that come in and tell your body, we're obviously dying, you should run faster. <laughs> but all you did was eat McDonald's, right? This happens a lot with my MS. <laughs> yes, it's very it, common it when actually, you have a neurologic actually, condition like that. Actually, when I have that, I, I have a relapse because the stress is so great that even though my brain says everything's fine, right. my body is acting like no, it's, it's not, not, not fine. Right. We don't like it when your body says they're not fine. I've had a relapse stuff is going, every right? Christmas. Yeah, last we don't want that. 10 years. So, if we're looking at ways to change the blood sugar response so that we don't have a cortisol reaction or an inflammatory hormone, hormone reaction, the goal is to reduce the way blood sugar is going to swing. And if we're stopping the way blood sugar is making it swings, it means we have to stop eating things that are full of sugars in them or carbohydrates just in general, which may mean fruit. Like apple may, an apple may do this to somebody, but apples are good for us, right? Unless you have a broken leg, then you don't go jogging on it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not that apples are bad, or bananas are bad, or whatever. It's if our hormonal blood sugar regulation system is sensitive enough, fruit may still not be good enough for us. Now, I usually don't start necessarily with fruit, but I'll often have people download an app. Anybody know the app I like to download? My Fitness Pal. Did y'all hear that? My what? My Fitness Pal. It's a little app in the App Store or Google Play with a blue square with a white figurine jumping across it. And it's a calorie tracking app. I don't care about calories. That's not part of our discussion today, but I don't care about calories. I care about what people eat and how their blood sugar reacts to it. If you track what you're eating there, you can hit a tab on there called macronutrients and then see what it looks like on the day. And it'll tell you if you're killing yourself on carbs, proteins, and fats, or doing something else. Statistically speaking, if your carbs are greater than 50% of your diet, you're having this reaction. Okay? Regardless of how many calories you think you need to eat in your life, that's happening. Statistically speaking, if your fats are greater than 60% of your diet, you are not having this reaction. You're having a very easy, chill life with blood sugar management, which means you're not having cortisol responses. You're not having inflammatory uh, cytokine reactions either. Does that mean that every person in the world needs to eat more than 60% of their diet and fat all the time? No. But if we're having inflammatory responses, and we're looking for two very quick ways we could start tomorrow to start changing our inflammation, it would be to eat more fat, eat fewer carbs, and get off of the foods that are probably causing inflammation for us. Now, in certain situations like someone with MS or epilepsy, this number may even need to be higher if their gallbladder and their liver can tolerate it. So Alzheimer's disease, which is a neurologic condition, is also known as type 3 diabetes in the medical research. Well, why would it be type 3 diabetes if it's their brain? Diabetes talks about sugars half the time. Well, it's because over time their brain breaks down due to the sugar mismanagement. And instead of getting neuropathy and pain and obesity, they just get Alzheimer's because that's their genetic lot in life to have a weakened system with blood sugar handling, whereas someone else might have to get their legs chopped off from diabetes brain things, specifically neurologic things that are not responsive to medication, well, they will often put people on something called a ketogenic diet. So what if your liver and gallbladder can't handle We'll talk about that in a second. 
Um, a ketogenic diet is like silly amounts of fat. You're doing like 70 to 80% of your diet in fat with less than 10% of your diet in carbohydrates and whatever is left over is protein. That is what they will stick someone with Alzheimer's on and start seeing changes on their um, telomeres and weird things in their brain that have the greatest chance of trying to reverse something like that. Alzheimer's is a bad news thing though. It has a very low regression rate or low improvement rate when someone starts doing something aggressive with them. But it's the best that we know of so far for something like Alzheimer's. If someone has epilepsy that doesn't respond, so seizures that don't respond to medications, there's whole research institutes on putting kids on ketogenic diets so that their epilepsy stops because that's all that they can find that fixes it. So in some situations, you have to go even more aggressive. In other situations, you don't. Once the inflammation is gone, most people can tolerate a diet of pretty much equal proportions. You know, that 30, 30, 40 concept that a lot of nutritionists talk about. And that's fine if we can tolerate it. But if we're walking around with our house on fire, we put the water on it, or we stop jogging on the treadmill, we gotta get the inflammation out first. So many of you have heard me say, go eat a diet full of fat and low in carb, and get off of everything that tastes good, so that your body can recover and heal, so that at some point we can potentially ease this back in because your body can now tolerate more carbs and you can bounce in and out here rather than bouncing in and out here like most people do when they come to see me. In fact, most people are in this world and occasionally they're going to hear if they're eating healthier prior to coming to see me. They'll say, I changed my diet, it's just not working, so it's obviously not diet, which is partial truth. Diet might not be part of it, but they may not have gone far enough to get out of this blood sugar craziness that was happening to start the inflammatory cascade to, to begin with. So the question earlier was, well, if we need to eat like this, what if your gallbladder can't tolerate it? Great or if you don't have one. Or if you don't have one. Two options. You can do an artificial gallbladder by eating bile every time you eat something. It sounds disgusting, but half of you are on something that has it in there. <laughs> so, so there are things where you take supplement-wise that just has bile inside of it because you don't have a gallbladder and you don't break down fats anymore, that when you eat, you just orally take a digestive enzyme that helps you break down bile because it is bile and therefore it tastes disgusting and they're the worst supplements in my office. So if you've ever tasted the worst supplement in my office, it has bile in it. Is that like Creon? Is that what, what word are these supplements called? Uh, it would say ox bile on the ingredients oh. list. They don't give it one of those fancy you know. 50 syllable words to code. Not the companies I use, at least. They're straight up, like you're eating cow testicles, right? This moment. You know, like, they just list it on the ingredients list. Like um, which I have those too, like, by the way. It's crazy. Because if you're a guy and you want things in your body to work better, it's best to do like fixes like. So if you have a heart problem, you eat more heart. If you've got a liver problem, you eat liver. If you've got a bile problem, you eat bile. If you've got a testicular problem, you eat testicles in a pill. Because you want to go eat rock and ostrich oysters. It's actually not that crazy. What foods we can eat, like, go for the high Um. So the question would be, what foods would we eat? But I haven't quite finished answering the previous one. So let me answer that one, and then I'll roll right into that, right? So if, bacon's awesome. Um, <laughs> if, you, if your kids don't like it. Um, so if you had to eat more fat, but your body could not take it because you have no gallbladder, sometimes your liver will use the cystic duct, which is the connection point from where the bile used to go into your tract, and make a pseudo gallbladder with it. And some people can actually do that high of a fat, even though they have no gallbladder, without any issues. Sometimes we have to give them oral supplementation so they can start increasing their fat. And many times what happens if they have no gallbladder or they don't digest fats well enough, they're so gummed up here, we have to just spend our time cleaning up the liver and gallbladder first so that they can eventually transition into something that balances out their blood sugar better. Mm -hmm. So sometimes there's just a hierarchy of what we have to address prior to being able to just stick someone on a program that we think is best for them from a blood sugar standpoint. Um, yeah, so that's part of the answer there, even though there's a much more patient-specific approach because we have to figure out what that cleaning up of gallbladder actually means for you, if you still had a gallbladder but could not tolerate fat. Um, but the next question was, what types of fats might someone eat? And, and to be honest, generally speaking, we would stay away from seed oils and trans fats. And that's pretty much the biggest limitation that we have. So if it's pig, because you like bacon, eat bacon. Bake, fat by itself does not kill people. Fat plus carbs makes a very inflammatory response. And it's because of how you utilize fuel 
as, I'm sorry, how you utilize food as fuel. So carbohydrates burn very efficiently. You put them in your body and they burn without even thinking about it. In order to burn fat, you have to deplete the carbs out of your life first so that fat becomes the next source of fuel. So that's extreme ketosis, but you don't have to quite get that far to do it. Many times with 20% carbs and 20% protein and 60% fat, your body will use up the carbs and then go right into using fat as well without necessarily needing to go into ketogenic diet. Okay? That's why a lot of times clinically, I'll start people on a 60, 20, 20 and then work from there based off of what their particular needs are. But when it comes to which fats, you know, a lot of people like avocados and olives and you know, butter, if you can tolerate butter. So after our 30 days, butter's like the first food I like to stick back in because it's high in fat. If you can tolerate the cheeses, that's usually fine too. But if you can't, then we just keep the dairy side out of it. Um, avocado oil, coconut oil, medium chain triglycerides or MCT oil is really efficient for people that need to get more fats but can't tolerate the breakdown of it. And that's because medium chain triglycerides, which are found in coconut oil and butter, have a way of bypassing the liver and gallbladder in their breakdown process. I'm going to explain this in hopefully normal words. But long chain triglycerides or long chain fatty acids require bile. So when you eat or when you see coconut oil on the shelf in the grocery store, it's white and it's congealed, right? Because at about 76 to 78 degrees, that's when it starts turning liquid. So at room temperature, it's normal. It looks snotty, for lack of a better word, right? <laughs> But if you raise it up because you set it in the car when you drove home and you come home and it's a lot of liquidy and sloshy around, the long chains were altered due to temperature so they become liquid, but at room temperature, they're back to being solid. Well, medium chain triglycerides are liquid at room temperature and they come from coconut or butter. And these chain, the, the medium chains or the short chain fatty acids just bypass the biliary, uh, the gallbladder system so that it goes right into digestion, goes right into circulation, it's awesome for brain food. That's the other thing that's huge for Alzheimer's research, is they just give people like six grams of medium chain triglycerides every day. They just, there's nonstop plugging down liquid coconut oil at room temperature. Because it bypasses all this and goes straight into the brain. So it's a big deal. And this helps get people's fat up without necessarily stressing out their liver or their gallbladder. Does that kind of make sense? So, in the morning. <laughs> uh, or like six a day. Like, like, like Alzheimer's people will take like six tablespoons a day. No, like normal people. Normal people? <laughs> <laughs> you forgot what you're actually you. <laughs> Medium chain triglycerides can cause bowel intolerance when you're working up to seeing how much you can tolerate. Three times a day, like every time you eat, just put a tablespoon of MCT oil on it. It bumps your fat up and allows you to keep your carbs down while yet sustaining satiety. But if you take too much of that too quickly before your bowels get used to it, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Plan on not going anywhere that week. It will clean you out. It does, it, it cleans all kinds of stuff out, it's crazy. Um, you ever feel like you want to be cleaned out? Just go drink a bunch of this and it'll move things around. Yes ma'am. Oh, I just want to say, um, to get my coconut oil, I just cook my vegetables in it or put it like okay. season my vegetables and with a little bit of coconut oil on it. So I can get my coconut oil, I just don't have that taste. I can eat my vegetables or like cook my chicken in it. I like to cook my chicken in it too and it gives it like a nice coconutty flavor and then I season it and so that's right. how I figured out how to use the coconut oil and the oils to get in. Because I don't like just drink you straight oil. Right. No just, just for culinary purposes, you can cook with these you do not want to cook with these. These are not to be warmed up because they denature and turns into trans fats. These become inflammatory when you hit them up, heat them up. So salad dressing. Yeah, you would use it like salad dressing, or you'd throw it in your Smoothie. hot chocolate in the morning, or whatever you want to mix it up with, right? Yes, so when coconut oil warms up, that's actually not good. You want to eat it in its no, no, no. state. Yeah. Whole coconut oil that includes the long chains, the white stuff that you have at room temperature. Mm -hmm. You can do whatever you want to that because it has a huge, okay. very high heat point before okay. it goes bad. You can deep fry turkeys in coconut oil if you wanted to. It's that high of a, of a temperature without messing up. If you're getting the liquid only coconut oil, which is just the medium chains, those should not be warmed up. They should only be used cold. Okay. okay. 
you had a question? No, I was having oh, a panic attack about oh, okay. pig being able to eat butter. So. <laughs> 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 I can't explain it, now I feel better. <laughs> yes, is there much a difference between the liquid coconut and the hard coconut oil? This is the only difference. Just at room temperature, if it's liquid, it's only medium chains. If it's hard at room temperature, it's got the long chains in it. From a health standpoint, technically there's no major difference. Unless you have gallbladder issues, then you might have an issue with this, but you would not have an issue with these. You would have a lot, much lower issue potential with those. Um, I feel like there's something else I want to say on coconut oil. Oh, medium chain triglycerides. If you get them from somewhere, Sprout sells some, H-E-B probably sells some, Costco you said? Amazon. Amazon, wherever you get them from. You want to know how they actually make them. Because long chains and medium chains and short chains are all in coconut oil together. So how do they extract the long from the medium so they can only sell you the medium? If they're using harsh chemicals to do that process, you probably don't want to do that. It's create, those chemicals create an inflammatory response in your body. If they do a temperature cooling process and they naturally extract it out, that's going to be a much safer, more tolerable way of consuming medium chain triglycerides. One company that I know warms up their coconut oil, pours it down a copper pipe, and they just let the copper pipe naturally cool down the, the, liquid, the liquid warmed up whole coconut oil. And then whenever it gets to its cooling point where the long chains solidify, the medium chains just keep dropping into the cup. And that's their separation process. I'm sure it's more fancy than that, but that's how it's described to me on how they do it. But that way I know they're getting temperature separated medium chain triglycerides rather than someone throwing in a bunch of aluminum containing molecule stuff that forces it to separate. Is that what cold express? Cold um, I don't know if there's an exact name for that. We just want to call the company and say, I want to buy your product for $12 at HEV. How do you separate it? And then they tell us. No. I've tried several mm -hmm. of them, and this one is the best, which is what he was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> it actually has no taste. Yeah, it has um, very little taste. Because my husband hates yeah. coconut. I, I cannot stand. Yeah. If I can taste the coconut, that tastes like water. Yeah, it's not bad at all. That's how a lot of people will just spoonful it in or that? salad dress it on. Huh? It's a good topic. Okay. <laughs> 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 that's what I thought. I just wanted to make sure yeah. you missed it. But that's not to say you can <laughs> only get it from Ralph's. You can get it from other places. That just happens to be the version we use, and we use that because of the way they do it and why it happens. Is that oily or is it like water? It's, it's oil. not like water. Yeah. It, it's not yeah. oily? It, 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 it has some oil texture because it's an oil, but it... Not like olive oil it, or vegetables. It's, it's not rich. as thick as some of the it other ones. It feels rich. Yeah. But it's I good. taste it. Everybody has it. I can taste it. If I don't cover it up... I don't like it. Uh, <laughs> cover it up and keep buying it. No, I'm just I, do, I use it and I love it, but right. I can I can taste it. Jolene can't taste it. And she's like, oh no, just do it like this, pour it on here. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is making me sick. No. I can put it in stuff and it's great. Uh, when you say stay away from seed oil, you mean grapeseed oil, sesame seed oil? Olive oil. Oil. Like, olive oil would be fine. Grapeseed oil is the weird one that's misnamed. It's fine. But you want to stay away from canola, palm. Okay. Uh, sunflower, peanut. sunflower, peanut, the seedy based ones. Lime. Safflower, yeah, things like that. Cool? All right, so what does this even matter, right? Why have we spoke for the last hour on Somebody asked the question things? of why. <laughs> okay. Why is they tend to go rancid faster? Oh. They're less stable oils. Oh. And so they become, when you buy like really a big container of like canola oil, you have it sitting in your pantry. Well, canola oil is Canadian. You can't trust anything. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, rapeseed oil, which is canola oil, is a trans fat. Grape and it's, I'm sorry. Grapeseed? No. Rape. 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 Oh, seed. okay. Grapeseed. And canola, they're the same thing. It's a genetically modified plant from Canada. I was only halfway joking. And, um, <laughs> and it's a trans fat. It's an it's a unstable fat to begin with. So when you consume it, your body treats trans fats and non-trans fats differently. So polyunsaturated fatty acids tend to go rancid faster, which are seed oils, and they turn into trans fats. And they just make inflammation in your life. So it's no fun. And that's why you can get a bucket of it for like five bucks. Yes, ma'am. Somebody had me buy a whole bunch of aloe vera juice and okay. bananas. Yeah. I have no idea if I could put it in smoothies. I have no idea what role that plays in anything. 
in this particular situation of these questions, not a huge role, because aloe vera is relatively low glycemic and it's not on our inflammatory list. But from an inflammatory gut lining standpoint, aloe vera is huge in the alternative world for just calming down digestive related things. It helps with absorption of food, it helps with stop mucosal buildup, it um, is antimicrobial, it has a bunch of stuff going on. So it's not a good thing. It's, it's generally a good thing, most people do well with it. It's also called Morinda, if you ever look that up. Okay, cool. Any questions with this? So why does this matter, right? Well, the reason this potentially matters is if you have an inflammatory thing going on, you can now see is diet associated with it or not. If your old football injury is diet related and you go for 30 days without eating things that taste bad and you help your blood sugar get better and your football injury stays the same, then there's less of a chance that diet matters for that particular injury. If you have Parkinson's and you shake and you stop eating corn and you stop shaking, then something that that corn is doing to your dopamine producing centers of your brain is a problem. And you should stay off of corn if you want your shaking and your Parkinsonian symptoms to get better. Does that kind of make sense? So this is not to treat disease, it's to help calm down the inflammatory process that we all manifest on a daily basis. We all live east of Eden. We are prone to injury and sickness and whatever, and our bodies are wonderfully created to be able to try and fight that off. Imagine what people do to themselves. I mean, like, people snort Tide Pods or whatever. I mean, like, whatever stuff goes on in life, people can withstand this junk somehow. And so when we look at this, we're like, but gluten, it's been around for forever. I've been eating this since I was six months old. We're looking for quality of life and function. Yes, it's true. People can drink alcohol and they don't die the next day from it, even though alcohol is a major toxic, abusive, inflammatory substance. And our bodies are designed to withstand that and be resilient. So we should be resilient to a lot of this stuff. But if our resilience has gone down because our inflammatory burden is so high, it's like jogging on a broken leg. And that's all we're trying to accomplish here is what can we do to heal and recover faster so that I can go back to being who I want to be, whether it's spending time with my grandkids or going on vacations or just waking up after eight hours and feeling refreshed. You know, whatever that paradigm might be for us, these are two simple ways in which we might address it. Are there more things we can do? There's all kinds of stuff we can do. Are there supplements and herbs and things like that that might help it go faster? Of course. That's why I do what I do, is to try and clinically identify what individuals need in order to get better faster or get stronger quicker or do whatever they might need to do. But from a take-home standpoint for tonight, you could go home tomorrow, take an inventory of, honest inventory of how you feel, what symptoms seem to ail you or how your cycle goes or how your sleep quality is or how your, your mood and interaction is with your spouse or your kids. And then you can say, what happens if I get off of some of these inflammatory things? Because the way that you interact with people is a neurotransmitter chemical reaction. And if you're short-tempered and angry all the time, there's a good chance you've got inflammatory stuff going on. If you get numbness and tingling in your hands every time you're driving to work, there's a good chance there's an inflammatory thing going on. If you want to lose 20 pounds, there's an inflammatory thing going on. So now we can start the process of identifying, am I losing weight? Am I feeling better? Am I thinking clear? Am I interacting better? And if all those things start getting better in a 30-day period, even if they're not perfect, if they're just showing progress, then it gives us a starting point that says, this is something I could do to help me that doesn't involve surgery, doesn't involve medications, doesn't involve side effects, and now I can potentially start taking control of my own health. And we can start tomorrow by just taking a concise inventory of what's going on in our own life. And after 30 days, we start experimenting to see what comes back into our life. If you eat dairy and you immediately have a reaction, don't eat dairy. If you eat dairy and you feel perfectly fine and you keep losing weight, then dairy's not your problem, even though it might be someone else's. Does that kind of make sense? All right, I'm gonna open the floor for some questions. I've been talking for an hour. What else do you all wanna know specifically about anything, anything? And I'll attempt to answer it. And we'll do this for like 15 more minutes, then we'll call it good. Onions or an allergy to onions? Onions are sulfur-containing vegetables. Sulfation is a liver pathway that is required for health. It's one of the six liver pathways we have. If you don't have sulfur in your body through dietary means somehow, your liver starts getting clogged up and things start happening. But some people create sulfur allergens, whether it's from a medication that they took, like... Penicillin. I'm sorry? Penicillin. Like penicillin can create a sulfur allergy. There are other sulfur drugs that yeah. I'm drawing a blank on right now. There's quite a few. My son's on one right now, and I'm like, oh, hopefully I don't have to try and fix this later. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, these drugs, though, can create sulfur reactions to where now you can't process sulfur-containing things like onions very well, 
and then that's potentially an issue. But I'm not exactly sure where I'm going with this, other than you asked about onions. They have sulfur, they're good for your liver, but they can jack you up if you have certain medically induced reaction problems from them. Someone over here had a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, <coughs> cholesterol on the keto diet. Or cholesterol and the keto like diet? It, is yeah. Because if I eat all this fat, I'm going to get fat, and I'm going to get high cholesterol. Well, you know, that's what the doctors, blah, 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 the doctors. They Certainly. say it. Right? No. <laughs> <laughs> if they ever write a book, we'll find out everything. They'll, they'll be no, like, oh, yeah, you can yeah. cut out this. Yeah, cut out all your fat and your cholesterol so high. Correct. Yeah. So we'll talk about that. that. First, let's understand what cholesterol is and what it does, right? So you have your liver, and it makes a protein called LDL, low-density lipoprotein. We call it cholesterol, but that's not really what it is. And then we have your heart, and you've got another protein called HDL, high-density lipoproteins. These are carrier transport molecules for our cholesterol that our liver naturally makes. About 75% of the diet, of the cholesterol we have in our body comes from self-made processes, which means the other 25% potentially comes from diet. So if someone has high cholesterol, their liver's doing something on overdrive and it's making a whole bunch of stuff. It's then being picked up by these bad guys, because these are what we call bad cholesterol, and then the good guys hopefully will save our lives, right? Good and bad are misnomers. That's not really what's going on here. They call it bad because it takes it toward the heart and it's assumed your body's dumb and trying to kill you. And they call it good because it's taking it from the heart and it's more likely trying to save you. That's not really how it works. It's just a carrier protein, just like you see trucks on I-10. So if the LDL proteins are small and dense, these are a tremendously inflammatory process that's going on. If they're large and fluffy, these are tremendously anti-inflammatory and good for you. The traditional cholesterol panel that we run has total cholesterol, LDL, HDL, triglycerides, total cholesterol to HDL ratio, and sometimes they'll do a VLDL, which is a calculator ratio. And it does not differentiate between these things. So the traditional cholesterol test that we run with all of our patients, I mean we as in the medical world runs, is a screening test. But it's not used as a screening test in practice for most people. It's used to tell people you have bad cholesterol, get on statin medication. In reality, that test was designed, if the triglycerides were under 200, to be able to screen for something and say, you might have an issue, go do a bigger test to figure out what's going on. And then you'd figure out the fractionation of the different particles to see, are you having an inflammatory response? Or are you genetically predisposed to have high cholesterol? Because some people are. Or do you need estrogens? Or do you need alcohol? Or do you need whatever to try and fix it, right? So with all of that being back said on the background, sometimes high cholesterol is genetic. Sometimes it's because you eat terrible things that cause your liver to shut down. And sometimes, most of the time, it's the way in which you eat that slows down the process systemically and just makes everything inflamed. And this draws right into step number two with the blood sugar concept. So if your blood sugar is doing this, you're more likely to have something called metabolic syndrome, which means your liver's gonna start slowing down, your weight's gonna start going up, your sex drive's gonna start going down, your blood pressure's gonna start going up, all the things of like a 50-year-old guy are gonna start appearing, right? Or a 50-year-old woman when you start going through menopause, right? All this stuff just starts going weird because of this thing called metabolic syndrome that often happens with crazy blood sugar management. So if we start eating lower carbs and higher fat, this goes away, which means this stops becoming a factor, which means this stops reacting as well. And so your cholesterol levels stop producing on its own. And your cholesterol, 19 times out of 20, will get better. But it's not because you're eating fat or not eating fat, it's because you're getting off of the carbs and getting better blood sugar management. So for most people, eating dietary fat and not eating carbs will change their cholesterol. But not everybody. Some people, we do it with them, and it just does nothing to affect their cholesterol levels. So we run the fancy test and we come back and we're like, oh yeah, you're just kind of one of those genetic predisposed people that no matter what you do, lifestyle and diet don't matter. And it's more of an issue of like estrogens in their life or B vitamins or something else that tends to get a better option, but it's still a genetic predisposition for being high. So to further answer your question, that's our background on cholesterol. That was a long background, but that was valuable information. If someone wanted to eat fat, They have to lower carbs, or oh, that's a terrible S. Or 
they're going to have an inflammatory reaction. Their LDLs will start going crazy high. So dietary fat in and of itself does not do it, but dietary fat with carbs will cause that inflammatory reaction because you burn the carbs and the fat just sits there and starts oxidizing or going rancid inside your bloodstream and it creates havoc on the blood system on cholesterol management. But if carbs go away, and not necessarily go away to zero, but if they diminish significantly and fat goes up, the, it, for most people it responds really well with their cholesterol, but that's why you monitor. So if someone was getting their blood test and they had high cholesterol on day one, and then on day 30 we re-ran it, we expect the cholesterol to probably be close to normal if they don't have a genetic thing going on. Yes, ma'am. When you say carbs, do you mean like like anything wheat, or do you mean like like fruits as well that have carbs in them? Um, for our purposes, with high cholesterol or blood sugar mismanagement, it'd be anything that has carbs in it. So when you get bored tonight and you download this app called My Fitness Pal and you just look and see what does it look like on my diet, and you see that over half, not necessarily you, but you, <laughs> you see that your cholesterol is higher than 50 percent. It's usually because we have a fruit, and we have some pasta, and we have some bread, and we have some, everything, and the cumulative effect is that our insulin and blood sugar management system starts getting slowed down. So in the beginning, when you start trying to get your ratios to like 60% fat, 20% carbs, and 20% protein, you go crazy. And you go crazy because it's different, because it's not the Pop-Tarts in the morning and the orange juice and the soda at night with your popcorn while you're watching The Bachelor. Or you just plain don't know how to eat that. Or you don't know how to eat that. You've got to figure out what, what you can eat. Because it's different. That. You'll notice that, that even some carbs, you're just like, man, I'm getting carbs everywhere, and I'm eating healthy. And you probably are eating healthy. You just may not be eating enough in the right direction to get blood sugar where you need it to be for a period of time before you bring your blood sugar back up into other levels to see what you can tolerate. If you start experimenting with this, consult your doctor because you might be breastfeeding and therefore you don't want to do it. <laughs> That's for the video. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> um, people that do breastfeed though, when they start lowering their carbs, they usually produce less milk. So the 60-20-20 for a breastfeeding person probably is not the best option. Someone trying to get pregnant and trying to stay pregnant and trying to do all their stuff, great option. But once you start breastfeeding, if you lower your carbs too much, milk production slows down. So depending on how long you want to do that, you may have to modify what you do carb-wise. Yes, ma'am. So then I guess I should have asked you this in our appointment the other day Shh, with that. <laughs> because, <laughs> so because I have issues with the heart, but then also the 60-20-20 and the blood pressure and I'm nursing, what would usually be about the right thing to look for. Oh, if you do 60 to 20, 20 you're fine if your milk production stays normal. If it stays if normal. If milk production starts going down, then you just have to accommodate by putting a little bit of rice or quinoa or something like that just to bump your carbs up some while still maintaining an anti-inflammatory diet. Okay. Awesome. Hey, Jolene, when you leave. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, so I read the other day that you can't be just partway gluten free. If you have a little bit, you might as well just eat it. And I kind of felt really discouraged and gave up everything. I would say it's a half truth. <laughs> For some people that might be accurate. For yeah, most people that's less of a thing. And it comes down to why we avoid gluten. Gluten was not just the magic food we decided to pick on. Yeah, gluten <laughs> creates an inflammatory reaction through the immune system <coughs> in some people. So if you think back to your immune system. Is that a Pac-Man? It is Pac-Man. <laughs> it's a white blood cell, a T cell specifically. So Pac-Man sees the bug and says, you don't belong, I should take care of you, right? And that's our normal immune response. If we have a good working gut, it's where we have a nice thick mucus barrier, the bug should never be able to come through because it stops and starts getting attacked up here before it gets into the bloodstream. If for some reason our gut's inflamed for one reason or another and the barrier thins and now the bug slips through, our immune system wakes up and starts becoming active, right? Foods do the same thing. Your body's immune system only reacts to a protein. So someone who has lactose intolerance isn't reacting to casein, the milk protein I told you to get off of. They're reacting to the fermentation of the sugars inside their gut. It's fermenting too quickly and making gas and swelling and digestion upset. If someone's reacting to casein or to gluten, it's because the food molecule they ate, like gluten, is now slipping into the system completely or partially undigested, and the immune system is flagging it and saying, you don't belong here, I'm going to treat you as if you're a foreign invader, 
and take care of you from, a neuro, uh, from an immunological standpoint, from the immune system. If that happens to people, it's an all or nothing process. Because a little tablespoon of gluten is might as well be putting like staff in your mouth, just shoveling up and eating E. coli or something. Because your immune system is now reacting. If it's not a true immune reaction, then your immune system is less involved and the gluten and dairy that we're avoiding is more just a thing to do because they're processed and inflammatory and have sugars and all the other stuff with it. So if it's an immune reaction, you should do your best to avoid it 100% and try never to get exposed to it. If it's not, when you go and re reintroduce it and you have a reaction, it's most likely just something else that's involved. Because once your immune system gets involved, it calls out all the troops. That's right. It turns You'll have a, a very significant everybody, reaction. Everybody goes. Right. And to further go down this rabbit hole, mm -hmm. this is why autoimmune conditions and those top four foods are really problematic. It's because your immune system works with something called an epitope. All right. It's going to get technical for a second. An epitope is the genetic structure of our DNA code in certain segments. So if we looked under a microscope, if you saw Jurassic Park ever in your life, and the little projector that they're shining up on the thing has a whole bunch of G's and A's and T's and C's that go across it, that's the genetic code of whatever protein that is, right? An epitope is a four code structure that the immune system will take and start shortcutting the process with it. Because if it sees E. coli every day of its life for 30 years, it doesn't want to have to read the whole thing for every time. So it starts shortcutting the process. Well, now if you have something like Hashimoto's autoimmune thyroiditis, you've shortcutted the process, and now every time you see a thyroid cell that's jumping around in your bloodstream, your body says, go get it, even if it's only the first four. Well, what if gluten looks like this? Definitely different than the top one, but if it sees that four structure thing, it says, oh, gluten, you must be my thyroid, let me eat you. And it starts attacking itself due to the autoimmune mechanism. And that's a lot of times why gluten and casein and the corn and soy are really reactive. And so because we don't run blood work that's extensive autoimmune panels on people from day one, we start them on autoimmune or low inflammatory reaction foods because we don't want their immune system, which deals with the inflammation process, to be flared up every time they're eating a Pop-Tart while I'm trying to get everything else squared away. So in some people, it needs to be all or nothing. And they unfortunately just need to treat themselves like they have celiac disease. Even if it's celiac disease of the thyroid, which would be Hashimoto's, or celiac disease of the brain, which would be cerebellar ataxias, or whatever, and then they'd say, you know what, I can't eat that. Because even though it doesn't mess up my gut, it causes me to walk around like I'm drunk when I eat bread. Which some people have these neurologic autoimmune conditions, or these thyroid autoimmune conditions, or whatever it might be. But it's those four foods that stimulate the inflammatory response through the immune system to treat it as if it's a bug. And if you wouldn't sit around and eat Ebola, probably shouldn't eat gluten, if that's the reaction you get. Does that kind of make sense? I know that was... So gluten exactly. looks like a bug? Epitopically, <laughs> yes, for some people. But that's the caveat. It's, it's like, if you have this and this reaction is happening, then you should never do this. But for most of us, it's, a eliminate, it's an elimination process to where we say, I'm just trying to stop jogging on this broken leg, and then I'll go back and eat a hamburger someday and see what happens. And you eat it, and you can tolerate it, and you're like, great, on the 4th of July, I'll eat a hamburger. But the rest of the time, I'm going to do pretty good so that I know that on a special holiday or my birthday or my anniversary, I can not have to worry about it because my body's now strong enough and it's not jogging on a broken leg. Yes, ma'am? Um, are, are we likely or is it possible to have like withdrawal from cutting out everything all at yes. once? Yes. You probably will. Um, and what do we do to manage that so we don't go, okay, I'm going to go get a coach or something? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm Lots of water. <laughs> I my phone, it said, suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> I was like, all right, I got a cleanse, and I'd open up my phone every day. I was like, oh, dang it. Dang, that's it. Um, no, unfortunately, you may have withdrawals. Some people do have more than others. You know, there are withdrawals of two types. Once again, going to this protein molecule issue, sometimes the immune system sees this as a foreign invader. Sometimes these portions of the immune system, or of these foods, slip into parts of your brain called opiate receptors. So gluten breaks down into gluteomorphin, which is an opiate. And opiates have addictive natures to them. And they have um, psychological factors that correlate with them as well. So some kids, like I work with some autistic kids, that when they go gluten-free, at like two in the morning, their mom comes down and they've climbed up in the pantry, and they've taken out the bread, and they're sitting there just munching on it like they're having a fix because their body's just going through this neurologic, uh, like, Addictive reaction, right? 
and it's an opiate response for some people. And so sometimes you will have a true withdrawal effect. You'll get the shakes, you'll get sweaty, you'll get nauseous, you'll get hangry, you'll get all kinds of crazy from it. Sometimes that's the reason why. Other times it's just convenient. You know, if you go to lunch at 12:30 and you pass by the same Chick-fil-A every day and you just eat there because that's just your life, and now all of a sudden it's 12:30 and you're told you can't eat Chick-fil-A because it has gluten, corn, and soy in it, now all of a sudden you're like, what do I do? In your habit, a creature of habit. So now you have withdrawals because you're not just doing your normal routine. And then sometimes it's withdrawals because your body will really, really miss carbohydrates. Really miss carbohydrates because it's easy. It's just waking up and instant fuel. That's why when you get jittery and shaky, you don't say, I wish I had bacon and eggs right this moment. You're like, give me a piece of bread or some orange juice or a Snickers bar because you want that quick fix of sugar surging through your system. So you may have withdrawals, but you may not. Eating more fat will keep your satiety levels better. Breaking the habit of just doing something different on your lunch break will also help. And then not eating your car is always a good idea. Yes, Can you explain how the muscle testing fits into all of these things that you do? Because you do a lot of that too, don't you? I think it's point. So the question was, how does muscle testing go in with this? And I recognize we're like at 8.30ish or so now. So we'll do this as our last question. And then we'll all dismiss for eating more food and hanging out. And I'll stay for a bit, but I've got a babysitter tonight, so I won't stay too long. Um, but muscle testing. Do you want the layman's term answer or like yeah. the less layman's term For people answer? who've never experienced muscle testing before. For the people that think it's good. Yes, sure. For the people that think it's good. <laughs> <laughs> it's really difficult to demonstrate muscle testing without like a way to demonstrate it up here. But I'll explain briefly what it might look like. So in my exams, in my way of actually looking at people, even though we conceptually know why I might take them off of food or why I might have them eat, I will do neurologic assessments with them as well. Manual muscle testing, which is involved in this process, deals with checking the nervous system and how it might talk to other parts of you. So your brain sends messages down your spinal cord out of different <coughs> nerves in order to do certain things. If your nerves talk to your muscles, joints, bones, tendons, ligaments, organs, glands, skin cells, and they do it in a specific pattern similar to a breaker box, and that pattern shows dysfunction of one shape or form, I will often look for ways to try and make that change. So if I jab on someone's gallbladder like I did with that lady the other day and it hurts, I will then put something on her tongue to try and create a change through the brain to come back and make the gallbladder less painful. This is a neurologic reflex test that happened to be through palpation or jabbing on somebody. And so I put bile in her mouth. Mm -hmm. It tasted disgusting. And I warn people that it's gross. <laughs> and most of the time their friends tell them I do weird stuff. But, <laughs> but I put stuff on their tongue and it put her pain that was a 9 out of 10 down to about a 3 out of 10. It wasn't perfect, but it told me that might be something beneficial for her by just jabbing on her. Well, if I'm looking at muscle tests, muscle tests if we cut the spinal cord in half like that and look down on it, your spinal cord will look like this. The anterior motor horn of the spinal cord drives motor activity of the body. So in order for us to do this, we have a brain nerve that fires, that talks to this portion of our brain that fires, that goes down our neck, out of our arm, and talks to our fingers. If there's some type of hiccup in that process, we may have a weakness, we may have pain when it's tested, whatever, and then I would use some version of muscle testing to determine how the nervous system reacts in order to try and get that muscle to re-engage again. Because if someone has a chronic injury, for example, they might have muscles that aren't firing or engaging like they should. And rather than just cracking their neck and calling it a day, which might be beneficial for someone, especially if it happened to be at that level, I might look for other ways like gluten to see if I put gluten on their tongue, does their whole body freak out and just shut everything off because it's having this inflammatory reaction that it's trying to take care of rather than trying to make something work better. So why don't you muscle test after 30 days for those four? Days. Because of presentation and how they are found in everybody's diets. So bread has a different gluten content than raw flour, which is different than yeast, non-yeast rising bread, or like crackers. Mm -hmm. Crackers, you know, like they have the way they're cooked and prepared denatures the proteins in different ways. And it's difficult, borderline impossible for me to muscle test through this gustatory uh, taste bud reaction through the body 
for every version of possible gluten someone might show up with. So what we do is an elimination diet, which is the gold standard for elimination for food sensitivities rather than muscle testing for blood tests or something like that. Yes, sir. Yeah, you were talking about the old injury? Yes, sir. What, uh, I mean, I don't just, I, I'm just curious. <laughs> Johnny Bench and all of them with their blue emu and everybody right. else out there with the Australian whatever. Okay. Right. Is that just covering it? I mean, that's just, what, what's it doing? Because they're all, you know, proponent of stuff is like natural and all this, but right. I mean, are they just covering a symptom, not taking care of it? Not necessarily. I don't know what it's in blue of you, to be honest. Okay. I don't know what the active yeah. ingredients are or anything. Some topical things will have something called protolytic enzymes inside of them when they're natural things. And protolytic enzymes are enzymes that go transdermally that affect the inflammatory status of somebody. Okay. So you can take a digestive enzyme with food and it'll help break down your food. If you take those same digestive enzymes on an empty stomach, your body doesn't digest them. It yeah. sends them out into circulation. And they act like miniature Pac-Man that go around and help clean up the bloodstream. So those will go transdermally into stuff, and so some products I don't have that. I don't necessarily know about that specific one or, yeah. or how that's doing it. Sometimes they'll have chemicals in them like lidocaine, for example, that it's just a pain reliever. It provides relief, but if their relief is temporary because that's all it's doing is numbing that nerve, yeah. there could be something structural or neurological or nutritional. That's what I'm saying. It's really not fixing it. It's just... Um, I don't, I don't it, know if that okay. is or not, depending on what's inside of it. All right. Cool? All right. I want to thank you all for coming out. Hopefully it was insightful for you. You have all kinds of fun things to do with your notes over the next 30 days. Experiment by taking a good inventory of who you are, what symptoms you've got going on, which ones you don't. Then attempt to remove the foods that are inflammatory for your particular blood type. Do it for a period of 30 days while you're getting your blood sugar in check. And then see how things work. Unless you like have a major reaction, then stop doing whatever you're doing. Call somebody to, to monitor you. All right? All right, so thank you very much. I'll stick around for a few more minutes. But, uh, thank you for being here. That was awesome, wasn't it? <laughs> so just really quickly, I just want to add a little bit here. Um, if you enjoyed tonight and how he presented here, um, imagine having him all to yourself and him doing, because every time you go into his office, he sits you in front of the whiteboard. <laughs> and he does a personalized one of this to everyone. And so it, the different questions that you're having, he kind of spoke to the whole group right now, but it's like specific to you and what you're going through and where you're at. And the following up with it um, continues to help support you on that plan. And that's, uh, those two th things combined for me were pivotal to me having any success with him. And so I wanted to encourage you guys that if you have any thoughts of, of um, making an appointment with him and just even have a first time consulting uh, to see if it's a good fit for you. I'd encourage you to do that um, as soon as you can.